Well, John, I think we just can roll into it. Yep. It's um obviously very conversational. You're the last stop on our tour. Oh. Up here in northern <laughs> northern yeah. New South Wales. I'm sick of it then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not at all. No. I'll tell you, I just reckon it keeps getting more interesting, the different people you meet yeah. and the different stories. It's like any of those deep dives. The deeper you go, the more the rabbit warren just sucks you in. Oh, yeah. does it ever. And that's mm. the beauty of this in conversation style is we yeah. can just see where it goes. Um, mate, I guess, yeah, firstly, what we've been asking people is just to tell us a little bit about what you're up to here. We're obviously on the Liverpool Plains. I'll get in early and say um, many people around here would be calling it God's country, but also many people around Australia would call this area God's country. Tell us a little bit about your pocket of the world. What makes it special? Well, it is special. The Liverpool Plains is, you know, some of the best soil in the world. There's, you know, only a few pockets of this black vertisol soil. And we're just so fortunate to be here. We didn't come here by accident, though. So, you know, my father actually was instrumental in us getting here, I suppose. But, yeah, it is It's the most beautiful soil you'll find. It's... Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and what are you guarded, guys farming? Guarded here? very jealously. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so our, we're having a big operation. We're sort of 1,500 hectares and we've got irrigation. So we've got groundwater as well as surface water. So the groundwater resource is for, well, it used to, we used to have a much bigger license, but then through water reforms, we lost 69% of our license permanently, which had to happen because the government over allocated the, the license by, you know, way too much and then so our other water source is the Mukai River which is an unregulated river and that term unregulated basically means that there's no headwater works on the river so there's no dam that controls the flow of the river the, the river is ephemeral so it just you know and we uh, have a license that when it's a flowing above a certain level we're allowed to access it and pump it to our license size so so they're the two sources of water we have which we use on the farm, which is predominantly, yeah, it's about 950 hectares is irrigated and the balance is dry land or riparian and river area and we've got some areas there we're doing a koala tree planting project on too. So Yeah, right. Yeah, that's with Country Road and Landcare Australia. It's a great little project we're doing. So, yeah, we've got, yeah, that's the break up of our farm, I suppose, yeah. And who who's farming here with you? So my sister is in partnership with me yep. and she is also involved in a lot of other off-farm boards. So she's a, a director on um, Namoy Cotton and Cottonseed Distributors and and a number of other things that interests as well. So her other time is spent here on the farm. And, um, yeah, we run the, the business together and my son Ben has just returned temporarily home while, you know, he just finished his four-year degree or double degree in agriculture and business and then he's heading over the States and Canada later this year, and I don't know, he might come back, I hope. Yeah, unreal. <laughs> now yeah. tell me, we, we just can hear a little bit of rain coming down outside. Is this welcome rain? Is it? Well, it is. <laughs> is rain it's, rain? Rain's rain. You know, look, <laughs> I, everyone loves rain. And I, you know, we, and we're, we're on a floodplain, so sometimes we don't like it. But this is, yeah, it's welcome. I mean, it's a bit difficult at the moment because we're actually irrigating. And black soil, for those who don't know what black soil is like, when it gets wet, it really sticks to you. So you will grow in height by, you know, sort of three or four inches very quickly when you walk in wet black soil. And when you're irrigating and changing siphons at three o'clock in the morning and it's wet, it's tough. <laughs> it's hard work. And so when you get a little bit of rain and you still got to keep irrigating because the crop needs the water, rain can be a bit of a pain in the bum, to be honest. And, yeah, I was out 4.30 this morning and it was sticking to my feet and, yeah, I sort of well, I wasn't cursing it because it's it's just nice to get the rain. But yeah, we're starting to get a little bit more now. There's a couple of storms today. I think we've had fourteen mils there this morning and um then a bit this afternoon. So I mean we'll we'll stop irrigating if we get enough to, you know, tide it off and if it becomes dangerous to get around the farm, well we'll just shut the water down until it dries out enough and we'll get going again because you do, with irrigation and cotton and peak flowering with the cotton, you just don't want to get behind. You've got to be a bit careful there. You can, um, crops, Start chasing crop, yourself. Yeah, well, the crops that we're using the water, so, yeah. You said before that your, your old man um, didn't come here by chance, so you're not farming here kind of by chance based off the decisions your old man made. So tell me a little bit about what led him out this way. Yeah, so a bit about, oh, I guess, the family history. I mean, on the Hampersome side, my grandfather, uh, he came from Armenia 
and he was a well, basically, I guess you could say, a refugee in a way. Uh, when the Australians invaded Gallipoli, um, the Turks used that as a good cover up to start uh, the genocide of the Armenian people. And my grandfather was able to escape onto a, a French refugee ship, and then he went to Nice in France, and then he came to Australia. And according to the Armenian Society, and um, uh, I believe he was the first Armenian to come to Australia. Wow. And uh, he was down in Melbourne, uh, was involved in the textile trade business, and then my father was born down in Geelong, and then he move or the family moved to uh, Kalara in Sydney. Yeah. And my father grew up in Stanhope Road in <laughs> Kalara, uh, but he always wanted to be a farmer. And his father was involved in textiles and uh, trading textiles and spinning um, businesses. But my father, he always wanted to be a farmer. And so he went to school in Sydney uh, in the North Shore. And then as soon as he could get out of school, he went to Hawkesbury Agricultural College. And during his holidays, he came up here, or to Barnbar actually, to work on a family friend's property because he just wanted to be on the farm. And uh, so when he was at Hawkesbury, he had an old A model Ford, which I've still got, and he used to drive up to Barnbar for, to work. And there's a shortcut that went from Breeza through to Gunnedah down the Pullaming, which was a black soil track, and it went through the plains grass back then and it was the dry weather road otherwise you had to go up around where the Camillory Highway is now which is up through Breeza up through Kaluas and then round to Gunnedah up on the hills and he knew about this black soil from you know that experience of getting bogged here I think <laughs> um, just out the front <laughs> yeah well basically probably weather like this where a storm had gone through but not the whole area and he drove through and got caught in the middle and uh he got to know about this black soil. Anyway, sorry about the long story short, but when he went farming down in um, South Australia and uh, didn't do very well at that game and sold the place and got out of it, and then he went um, to South America where we've got relatives over there and he visited them and then he went to America and he bought an old pickup, Ford pickup and he drove across America and looked at farming and to learn about agriculture because he's just passionate about it. And in the Brazos Valley in Texas where there's black soil similar to here, he saw what they were doing with this black soil. They were growing cotton and corn and soybeans and sorghum and, you know, all these different row crops. And he just he, the, the light went on in his head. I know where some of that is in Australia and it's just sheep and wheat. <laughs> so he came back here and he went to the local real estate agent and he said, I want to buy some country on this black soil. And the real estate agent was like, you know, this guy's got wood duck written across his forehead because nobody wanted black soil. The bull was a pound a pound back then. The wheat that grew here because the soil was so fertile, it grew up and then just fell over because at that stage the gabo variety hadn't been invented or developed, sorry. And so, yeah, the people who were here mostly were soldier settlers, so they came out of Second World War and through the ballot system, which is up on the wall there, you can see the lots that were made up, they drew these lots. And the lots down on the black soil were 1,800 acres each, whereas on the red soil in the hills they were 600 acres. And that sort of gives you an indication, you know, this is fit for purpose, you know. The hill country was good for sheep. So they got 600 acres. The poor buggers that drew the black soil I got 1,800 acres, you know. Poor because bastards. It was, yeah, it's really <laughs> tough. You know? But, you know, and that, that's the old story. But and my father knew something that they didn't. And so he thought, you know, I'm going to get some of this country. And the guy that drew this block, Drayton, the property Drayton, which was 1,800 acres back then before it was expanded later on by my father, but he was a soldier settler. And they, under the rules of soldier settlement, basically when they drew their lot, they were given the property to farm to, and they had to put a house on it, put a boundary fence and permanent water. And after 10 years, if they did these things and, and, and looked after it, obviously, the title then transferred to them. So they actually owned the property. And he, this guy that drew this property, a bloke called Charlie Stokes, he got it in 1951 through the ballot system. And on the 1st of January 1961 was the first day that he actually owned the property, and that was the day in the Cluis pub that he had another title to my father. So the first day he could get out of it, he got out of it, and he went and bought some red country, um, a place called Kulnini up in the hills, so huh. uh, near Spring Ridge. So he, um, my father was sort of like, you know, everyone was going, what do you want this stuff for, you know? But he had a dream and uh, an idea, and and he had a, he had a thought there'd be water underneath as well, 
So he got the place in 61, January 1st, um, and then in 1965 he put his first irrigation bore down. But in the meantime, he'd actually started, you know, to be, uh, he started with the cattle here and got rid of the sheep straight away. He hated sheep. <laughs> Wretched nibbling creatures, he used to call them. <laughs> uh, and then he, uh, yeah, and then he put down the first, uh, sorry, started uh, doing a bit of row cropping and put down the first irrigation bore in 65, a successful irrigation bore in 65 and started irrigating. And so he was a real pioneer, you know, like he, was, he was first to do row crop sorghum and corn and, had a dibble in safflowers. Some he grew a lot of sunflowers. You can see the woods on the wall there, and yeah, really got into some pioneering type agriculture and changed the land use around here. Like a lot of people thought he was going to go broke, and then their the property values started going up, and then they were angry at him because they had to pay higher rent rates and because um, the values of the land was going up. And those that wanted to, you know, either switched over to row cropping or they sold out, and other people came in. So wow. that's a bit of the story. So that's how we ended up here. Yeah. What a history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just I guess he knew the value of it and he had a dream and he knew what you could do with it and uh, got in and did it. And so then, yeah, and he's try- look, he's been pioneering a lot of things. He was he and uh, another guy called Jock Warren were first to grow cotton down this far south um, in the early days, 1982. Um, and now it's, it's predominantly cotton all around us now. So, yeah. So what were, for you was um, was the opportunity or, or the want to come home? I guess, well, growing up on a farm and um, free labour as a kid. <laughs> well, actually, no, I shouldn't say free labour. My father was always very good. He did pay me for my work. There weren't big wages, but, it, you know, I had a bit of money to, in my pocket. So, yeah, I, I guess I just loved doing what I was doing back then and I wanted to be a farmer as well. I went to Hawkesbury Agricultural College as well. Same car? Uh, no, okay. a Ford though. I did have a Ford. Uh, yeah, the yeah, old Falcon station wagon. Yeah, and yeah, and then after I left college, I went and worked my way around Australia. An old, um, old Toyota troop carrier, and yeah, worked all the way around. It was one of the dreams I had, and set myself a goal to do it. And and then after that, I came home. Oh, nice thunder there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And the rain's pouring outside. It's lovely. And then, yeah, I had to come home there because I was going to stay up. I was up in the in the Northern Territory at the time, but we had these wet harvests year after year in the late 80s it was. And it was in 1990. It was uh, I was up there in July and it was the dry season, mustering season up there. And the um, my father sort of was intonating that, you know, we haven't even got our cotton crop harvested and we've only, we're running out of time before we've got to plant it. And I thought I, got, I probably should get home. You know, I just get that, that feeling that it'll be a good idea. And I, so I came home, and I'd been home since. So, yeah. In the end, we had five weeks to go from the end of picking through to planting. Just a quick turn around. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I was just so wet, and we were driving cotton pickers through mud. And yeah, long story that one. But yeah, never want to go there again. And that's actually set up a lot of the mindset on our farm of earliness is next to godliness. So, you know, if we can get things done early and on time, trying, you know, prevent picking in the wet and things like that, we, we sort of manage a lot of what we can do. Yeah, I mean, look, who has a business without a roof over it? You know, that's what a farmer is. So, yeah, we're at the vagaries of the weather, but we try and do what we can to minimise that impact. How has, so you talked about mindset, but how has discipline come into that? And, and I guess looking at like foregoing opportunities based off timing. I guess, well, I mean, some might say that I employ too many people, but we, we work on the basis that if we don't get the job on, done on time, you'll more than pay for your wages <laughs> with, with what you lost, you know. So, yeah, we probably run an extra person than, we, than a lot of other people, but then we try and get that job done on time. So that is that which is sort yeah. of question? Yeah, yeah so, so timing's everything. And you'll, it's you and your sister farming, but you employ extra staff for yeah. those key periods? Yeah. Um, well, we keep trying to maintain just permanent staff here and every now and then we use casuals, but yeah. um, predominantly just our permanent people and keep them on good and bad times, yeah. And so what, what stage did you end up taking over the, the day-to-day running? Well, the really sad part was my father got cancer in not long after I got home and it was a, a prostate cancer that was unfortunately misdiagnosed by a doctor, so it developed further than it. I mean, today, you know, it's a curable, reasonably curable disease, unless it's a very aggressive form. But anyway, it, uh, with dads, it was reasonably aggressive, I think. And 
by the early 90s. I got, I got home in the end of 1990, August 1990. I think it was 92 he was diagnosed and he died in 98. Yeah, so right. I was fortunate the gift that cancer gave us, I suppose, was that we knew it was coming. Well, my father did. He didn't tell me everything. But he was very good in, in mentoring me into, into managing the farm and running it. And, you know, I was really fortunate that I had that experience. I was sharing it. You know, and he gave me enough rope to you know, hang myself, but then just before I would, he'd cut the, the rope and help me out. So having that, that handover period, I guess, was a gift that cancer gave us, you know, as compared to, say, a car accident or something like that. So, yeah, I had time to, to, to ease myself into management, and it was, it was good, yeah, a really good period. And then, I mean, look, I was only 30 when my father died, and uh, it was a – well, 30, 31, I think it was, yeah. So it was, you know, like straight into running a farm, managing all these staff, mm. had to learn the hard way, you know, what's your management style, how to manage people. Probably the, the most stressful thing, I think, probably running a business is the people, you know, hail, storms and floods, and they're all things you can manage, but you can't manage people, with their, you know, what they bring to work and what the, that sort of thing. So you got to learn how to do that. That's a, uh, that was probably the biggest learning curve I had. I'm interested how, how or when your sister came back into the business and, and you two partnered, but also how, how did that come about and how was it managed? Well, so she, she was over, she's a chartered accountant by trade, mm-hmm. and she was over in um, London working for Goldman Sachs. Yeah, wow. Uh, she'd worked for Ernst & Young in Australia and um, very, um, apparently she's very highly regarded. Yeah. Um, and then she was, yeah, so she's had um, some very good jobs and experiences then. And she'd done her travel too. She'd been through um, South America um, and stuff like that and all through Europe. And, it's a belt. Um, um, but when my father, in the latter stages of his cancer, she decided to come home and I think it was in 96, I think, she came back. And... She came back in the in the farm then, and we sort of yeah we worked very well together, and we, she's been with me with me as a partner in the business since. Obviously, your old man really evolved farming really for this area, but also for him. Did you have as your sister came back as you took over the managing of the business? Did you have an area that you were really looking to kind of hang your hat on in terms of farming in within the business, or was it just continuing on with what your old man had started and and yeah, I think that it probably it was continuing. It was an evolution, um, like everything. You've, you you take a while to work out what your style is, and what you enjoy, and how you you do it, and how you, you run the business, I suppose. And I'm not sure where the proverb or the saying comes from, but they say a man never really grows up until his father dies, and I think that's true. I mean, you all of a sudden you you're the the person who has to make the decisions. You're the person who has to you know live or die by that decision. You just can't pass it back and say, oh, you, you know, it's your fault. Mm. <laughs> it's up to you. And so I guess that's how, as a young person growing up, and, you know, we had trouble with the banks when after my dad had died and, and you know, we had a very good relationship. We developed a relationship with a new bank at the time Rabo came in and they backed us, which nobody else would at the time. And they've been, you know, very good to us over the years. And so... Finding out how to do that type of thing and, and how to, and we went through some terrible times in the two, early 2000s. Dad died in 98. And then we basically had, in 1998, just after he died, we had five floods in that winter. So we lost our winter crop and then I had trouble getting a crop planted and all those problems. And, and then all the insect issues that came with it. We had a currency position that was out of the money and we had to buy back. And it was all, anyway. We basically went through about five and a half years of hell because um, we then, yeah, in November 2000, we lost our, uh, we had a flood over the whole farm and lost our wheat crop and most of our cotton crop. And this is Juanita, my sister Juanita and I were, you know, quite young and we were trying to run the business and, and the banks were, at that time, were, were, were chewing on us. And um, anyway, fortunately, we were able to find somebody who would back us financially with Rabo and, um, and then we had a hailstorm came in and wiped us out. And then I think um, the year after that, we had a sandstorm, we had a drought sandstorm, which um, then, you know, it, it ringbarked all the cotton plants. And so we lost 30% of the cotton crop with that. Um, then um, we had a 2,4-D drift over our crop, 80% of it wiped out. So, yeah, we went through a really tough time, but 
one of my uncles said to me at the, at the time, he said, John, he said, cherish it. He said, because if you can survive this, you'll <laughs> be able to survive anything. Yeah. And, you, and when you do have the money, you won't be stupid with it. And, um, yeah, we came through the other end of that tunnel. It was a, I don't know if you can swear on this, but, yeah, basically it was a, it was a shit waterfall and no one turned the tap off, you know, would turn the tap off for us. So, yeah, until finally that did turn around and things started getting better. We knew how to run the business in a tough time. It was a, it was a great learning experience at the time, but it was tough. Was your uncle right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested, so, so today with what you guys are doing, here yeah. like how's it I, I see that you've got a few different signs farmers for climate action you're obviously very progressive in the sense of the areas of agriculture that you're involved in and supporting what's happening kind of in the paddock what are you what are you guys looking at and how's that evolving as well yeah i guess well my father's always very progressive in you know well he used to use the word balance rather than sustainable because back then the sustainable wasn't a key word but I guess that instilled in me that same philosophy that, you know, if you're here for a short time, we'll just, you know, get in and just rape it. If you're here for a long time, which we are, you know, you want to improve the soils, you want to look after it. And and he started that journey back in, I remember back in the early 80s, he had a Japanese soil scientist, uh, a guy called Eric Kawabi, who was, you know, revolutionary in his approach to managing the soils. And I guess that instilled in me that the need to, you know, your soils are your backbone. That's what looks after you. So we've always, I've, well, I've always continued with that approach and, you know, looking after the biology in the soil and how we farm it and um, the fertiliser types that we use and, you know, the rates of fertiliser. All those things come into, you know, sort of the, the ethos of, of trying to achieve the best result but also the best result for the future and for the future generations. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's that, that, that's became, it's just an evolution of time and having those teachings as a young man, I guess, and then continuing on and developing them. As far as, yeah, you asked about climate, farmers for climate action and things like that, you know, I was always thought that, you know, climate change was an issue. I didn't think it was you know, going to be a major issue. But in 2013, I went to China on a tour of uh, uh, cotton, we were going over looking at spinning mills and working out whether we could deal directly with Chinese spinning companies. And that was my aha moment. That was my, whoa, this is real. When we were there for 14 days and we could look at the sun every day without hurting our eyes because of the pollution, um, being on the 70th floor of a hotel and not being able to see the ground because of the pollution driving for five hours at 120 kilometres an hour in a bus on these massive freeways and, you know, between areas and you just don't get out of the pollution. It was pollution, pollution all the time. Driving past these massive coal-fired power generations that had hills nearly the size of the Breezer Hill of coal beside them, belching out the smoke. I then realised, and I, I and, and the real aha moment was when we were showing this uh, cotton spinner, a Chinese cotton spinner, a photo of a John Deere cotton picker, and he was going Photoshop, Photoshop. And we're going, I was like, what do you mean? And he said, that's Photoshop. And we're going, the cotton picker's real, mate. That's what we pick our cotton with. He said, no, the sky. <laughs> and we're going, what do you mean? He said, the blue sky. He said, that's Photoshop. And we're going, no, that's what it's like in Australia, mate. And that was sort of like. Wow, that's what these guys accept what they've got as their reality. We've got this blue sky we accept as our reality, but we don't realize. And that's when I came back to Australia and I started thinking, you know, climate change is really going to be serious. We have no concept in this country. And look, I, I've done, you know, we've got, um, we've put in a lot of solar on our farm. To, we've got, um, I think, 250 kilowatts of solar now. I've got another 100 kilowatts to go in. And that look, that's hopefully reducing our footprint, but it's also reducing our costs as well. And I look, I fully understand that, you know, thinking that in Australia we're going to change the climate by doing these actions, it's a bit like standing on the Harbour Bridge and to use a friend of mine saying, stand on the Harbour Bridge, peeing in the water and hoping you're going to change the temperature of the water. Well, it's not going to happen. We've got to have everybody's got to be on board, you know, and we are just a grain of sand on this beach, you know, as far as climate change goes. But if we're not setting an example, how can we ask somebody in a third world country, look, you've got to change. You're, you're making this terrible. Um, so we've got to yeah, set the example, I suppose. And so for that reason, yeah, I've done that. And uh, and 13 years of my life fighting a coal mine at the back of the farm, I suppose that's all part of it, yeah. 
Yeah. I want to ask you about, so the last few years you've had, so you went through those five years in the early 2000s of mm. losing crops. History repeated itself only a few years ago. Yeah, well, that's true. So we had the drought that, you know, I don't need to tell people out there what, how bad that drought was. So for us, it was three years. We had two years first in our history of having a farm with no crops other than what we had irrigation water for. So with the reductions, uh, we've had, you know, as I said, the 69% reduction in our um, bore water licence. You know, that really cut back the area of crop we could grow and we had no winter crop. There was no dryland crop. Um, so 80, nearly 80% of our farm was fallow. That was a, an absolute eye-opener. We kept our staff on, um, although we had one guy who wanted to leave and we said, well, we're not going to hold you back. We didn't replace him. But we made it through the drought and came out the other end, um, a bit bruised and battered like everybody, but we, we survived it. Then, unfortunately, the year we came out of the drought, we then came, you know, had a beautiful crop. And November 2021, the whole farm went underwater. So it was a repeat of 2000 as far as the – but we'd learnt from 2000. We learnt how to manage after that, you know, um, those floods. And at that time it was a horrible, you know, we were picking wheat up. You know, it was a week off harvest and then it suddenly went underwater. And, and I don't know, somebody out there bought that wheat. I don't know why that wood had bloody <laughs> roots growing out of it and, all, and full of dirt. But anyway, we were able to sell it. And the cotton crop that didn't survive, we quickly, very quickly turned around and planted um, other crops in there. And fortunately, through our herbicide programs, you know, with you know the Roundup Ready cotton, we don't use any pre-emergent herbicides in our cotton country. So that didn't lock us out of, you know, planting sorghum or sunflowers or whatever. So, yeah, we quickly turned things around and we did it. And then just for to rub a little bit more salt in the room, <laughs> November 2022 came along and the, basically a week Later, from the previous year, the whole farm went under water three times. And so, yeah, we had to and, – and one thing, you know, look, the reason why our soils are so beautiful is we live on a floodplain. We're in a narrow part of the floodplain, so we can't flood protect. We can't put levees up. We've got, you know, overtopping banks. So when, we, when it floods, we don't impact our neighbours. We share the flood, so to speak. And, you know, with the privilege of these beautiful soils comes that damage that the flood brings. So – you know, I own a grader and I own an excavator for a reason yeah. <laughs> and uh, you just get stuck in it and rebuild the farm because it all gets knocked out. You, know, like you basically got to rebuild all your infrastructure and so there's a lot of work and that's when I bring casuals in to help out, you know, because we just still got a farm, still got to grow or try and resurrect what crop we've got and go again. So, yeah, look, it's but that, that I guess, five years of tough and we're 2023, 24 now. We got through 23 harvest just. We had about... A bit, nearly half of it off before it rained, and downgraded the rest. But a very dry winter here last year. Like um, we had no in crop rain, but these beautiful black soils they hold so much water. You know, like we had a full profile from the flood in November twenty two, so we were able to grow a crop on a full bucket because there's there's bugger all in crop rain, and we still got a reasonable harvest. Yeah. And so when you go through events like the early two thousands and then the last few years, you mentioned you. St- you're taking this long-term view of it, but it must hit the bank balance pretty hard. Like, how do you how do you balance that? I guess the desire, I don't know yeah, if that's the right word, to go hard to try and recover. Yeah, I think. Look, it's um, and go through succession planning at the same time. Um, <laughs> I guess it's you. You really got to um, draw on, on your experience, and that 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 five years I was telling you about after my dad died was great experience to draw on. And, in, when these things hit us again, because you know, one, keep your mental health. You know, don't don't lose your sh- stuff. You got to, you know, uh, keep thinking straight. It's a business without a roof on it. Accept it, get over it, and rebuild. So the mental side is very important. Getting in and just doing things. You know, like trying to surround yourself with good staff as well that have got similar sort of belief in what you're trying to do, and don't don't throw the you know, the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, by going in and going hard and, and wrecking your soils just because you're, you're a bit behind. Mm-hmm. Stick to your game plan, you know, stick to what you know you can do well and try and make every, you know, post a winner. doesn't always happen that way. I mean, look, things, you know, we, we could easily, I mean, with the forecast, we could easily get another flood in February, you know, so 
because the, the Matt and Julian oscillation wave that's due, I think, in sort of late February is going to be a pretty strong one, I think, looking at it. And that could be another flood. That one will hurt because everything's out on the table now. Like, you know, we, we're basically at the rule at table and all the money's on the table. So, but yeah, we'll make it through. We'll see what happens. You, you mentioned mental health. I want to ask you about fishing. It's a pretty good little conduit, and I'm sure the two are very well intertwined. Tell me a little bit about that passion for fishing, but also how that time away from the farm benefits you. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, look, and I, I warn people out there, I mean, fishing can't be the solution. You know, you, you can easily go and hide in fishing to hide your problems. Mm-hmm. But I use it because it's a, uh, they call it the flow, I think, in you know, these woke people uh, going about stuff. But <laughs> it's getting into that zone where you are so focused on what you're doing that you forget about all your other issues. And that's for me when I get on a, on a stream, whether I'm fishing for cod, trout, or I'm out in the ocean fishing for tuna or uh, chasing bone fishing kiribati, you know, whichever it is, to be honest, when I'm fishing, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm so focused on that target. It's a primal need for some people. I mean, I enjoy, you know, catching and releasing. I used to, you know, do a lot of hunting when I was younger and I don't do that now. I prefer to catch and release. So. But it, it, it satisfies that hunger, that need to go out and hunt for me and you can – Basically, everywhere I go fishing is beautiful. Like it's, you just have to slap yourself and go, you know, can you believe you're here? You know, you look up and you're in the mountains or you know, a beautiful trout stream in New Zealand or up around the, in the New England, you know, chasing cod and you just look around, you just can't, you know, wow, you know, I'm, I'm really in, in this place. You know, I go up to Harvey Bay and go on the inside of Fraser Island chasing tuna on the flats with fly and, you know, you look around and you just go, this is the most beautiful place in the world. And so it ties all of those loves together for me. I love bushwalking. I just love fishing. And so, yeah, it puts everything together. And I'm just planning a trip right now to New Zealand. So where it's, it's going serious backcountry, though. Like it's, <laughs> it's choppering in and, yeah, backpack job. How good. Tell me about the Bay. Was it the Big Fish competition? Yeah, so... I'm trying to remember what year was it, 2018 Do you want me to go get the trophy for um, you? <laughs> it's somewhere around there. 2018, that's 2018, it? it's is a big it? trophy. Yeah. That's how it's so no, easy to it's, see. It's, it's, it, the, the trophy is bigger than what it actually represents. It'll be at least 20 metres away from me, and that 18 is very yeah, big. Yeah, okay, it's 2018. So <laughs> Bayer came up with a concept about, you know, they wanted to put something back into agriculture, and in particular they wanted to put something back into rural mental health. And some very smart people within Bayer thought, you know, well, how can we do this? And they... They, they, I don't know how they came up with the idea, but they, they worked out, you know, farmers generally love, you know, being outdoors. They love fishing. And when they go fishing, they all talk and they, you know, they share their problems and stuff like that. So they, they created the Bay of Big Fish Challenge, which basically um, you're in a team, and I encourage anybody who's listening to the podcast to look into this. Um, you get into a team, a group of mates, and you form a, a team. You can call it some stupid name. I think we're the, the Dry Creek Fishers or something <laughs> First House Rural Dry Creek Fishers is the name of our team. but And when you go fishing, you basically catch a fish, a different species hopefully, and you put on the brag mat and the number of centimetres. Um, so the biggest one you catch of that species, the number of centimetres, then buy a, donate money on based on the number of centimetres towards the, um, the what's called the FLY program, mm-hmm. which is a mental rural mental health retreat for people to go to from people in agriculture and this money that is raised through going fishing with your mates helps fund it. So you can then, if you've got a mate or you know somebody that is, you know, going through a pretty tough time mentally and they need a break away, you can nominate them to go to this uh, the fly program and the mental retreat, and um, they will get the opportunity, all expenses paid, the travel, everything to go to this and and. Um, experience you know the snowy mountains or wherever the program is being held and um be out with other people like-minded people and and they've got facilitators that help you through the issues you're dealing with um you get reconnect with nature and yeah might learn to fly fish you don't have to but they do fly the fly program is about fly fishing and it's been identified around the world i mean in america there's some massive programs with fly fishing which has been proven to help people like a lot of breast cancer sufferers um, there's big groups in America where they go fly fishing because it helps them to deal with their issues at the time. So, 
yeah, I encourage people to look into it. You know, it's it's been a great program. And anyway, I'll look at the the trophy. I was on the first program. It was a bit of a pilot project, so it wasn't that big a competition. It's a lot bigger now. There's a lot more people involved, and it's a much more prestigious award if you get it. So I was I was sort of um, I, I shared that reward with another guy from Victoria. Yeah, so. Kevin Brooks, yeah. We'll include a little bit of info in the show notes around that and, and a couple Please of links. Please do, yeah. I, I really encourage people to look into it. I think it's a great program. And it's a great program if you know somebody that's going through a bit of a tough time to have a look at and nominate them for it because it is, it's a retreat. You know, you get away and you're dealing with people who are professionals at that too so they know how to deal with it and give you that, that break away from the farm. Mm. So, John, looking ahead, what's over the hill? What's what's coming up ahead? Obviously, we've got New Zealand fishing. That's in the very, very near term. But what does what the next five to ten years or so look like for you guys out here? On the farm? Mm. Um, farm and life, what's happening? Yeah, so look, uh, we just want to get better at it. We're still novices, I think, but there's a there's some stuff we're doing with our soils, which is you know starting to really pay off. It's a bit like a flywheel. As you get the soil biology right, it just starts to run itself and that's helping reduce our inputs a lot and we're getting much more efficiency out of the the products we're using. The solar that we're expanding on slowly, my envisage is probably not five years but closer to 10 years where hydrogen, you know, we'll be making our own hydrogen and powering our own tractors and headers and irrigation bores with hydrogen. Yeah, wow. Because, look, there's a lot of time where the, that solar is just put pumping power back into the grid and we're not getting much money for that. They're, they're thieving it from us. But I'd rather put that money into a hydrogen generator, basically, and storing it for when we need it mm-hmm. and using that energy on the farm. Um, we looked at biodiesel there a little while back, but it was quite achievable. But the price of fuel dropped too much to, at the time to continue with that project. So, but I really believe that hydrogen will be a major contributor to agriculture in the future. So, yeah, I see that that's definitely going to be uh, the future for us in that area. What other things in, in five years' time? Well, I'm not sure one of my children, Sarah or Ben, will come back to the farm, hopefully, and I'll get more time to go fishing. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so that's probably where we're going, yeah. Fantastic. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. I think, yeah, it's a beautiful part of the world where you guys farm here and really interesting story as well, which I'm sure so many people are going to get so much out of. Well, I hope I don't bore anybody too much. (laughs) (laughs) I don't reckon so. Thanks, mate. No worries. Thank you.